I've entitled this first session, um, Anglicanism, How Did We Get to Where We Are? And what is very important for me, and what I hope will come through, I probably will emphasize it a lot, is more important than how did we get to where we are, but why we are where we are. As uh, many of you will know that I have not been an Anglican for very long, um, and I'm not the kind of person who just does it because I'm told to. I like to know why. And coming into the Anglican Church, there have been a great many whys, and uh, many of you won't know that I've actually uh, resigned from the church twice, and God has brought me back and not allowed me to leave, and again I've asked the question, why? And all of this questioning has caused me to really dig deep into what is Anglicanism, and why am I here? And the more I uncover, the more excited I get. And so I hope to be able to share some of this excitement with you as we go along. Um, I hope for you to be able to begin to see some of the excitement. And I may emphasize Anglicanism, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to create the impression in anyone's mind that I'm saying that we are better than anyone else. Um, or that we have got it all right and everyone else has got it all wrong. Um, and I hope that will come through, that, that, that it's not a case of being better or, or having it all together, because no one's got it all together. Not a single one of us have got it all together. So, um, there is a quote by a minister of foreign, not a minister, professor of foreign affairs, Michael Mandelbaum, um, at the Johns Hopkins University, no less. The past is our only real guide to the future. And so that's why, well, it's not why I love history, I just love history. I don't know, God gave me that love for history. So, but it's why I feel history is so important. Because if we don't learn from the past, we're bound to make the same mistakes again. And I'm, I'm sure there's a famous quote to that, ex that uh, as well somewhere. Um, so, as a, as a launch pad, and to set the tone and set the picture and put you into the picture, there are seven periods recognized periods of church history. We're not going to explore all seven periods of history. That would take a few years of, of uh, deep, in-depth study to uncover all these seven periods of church history. Um, they are roughly divided into those years in history. So the apostolic period was from 30, from when Christ was crucified, to 100 AD when the Apostle John died. The only apostle to die of natural causes. Um, the rest were all martyred. So 30 to 100, that's the apostolic era. And so the periods of church history have been divided into, and it's kind of roughly, and right at the outset I want to emphasize that God, we as human beings, like to put everything into neat little boxes. So as you can see, we've got a neat little list with our neat little boxes. And we like to put neat little labels on our neat little boxes and categorize everything. But the kingdom of heaven and the world that God created doesn't actually really work like that. In God's economy, everything is interconnected and interlinked and, and is supposed to work in a harmonious, symbiotic type of relationship. So the word of God is just like that. So we have gone and put it into boxes, so we've put it into chapters and verses, which it was never, but to make it easier for us in our human thinking, we've put it into boxes. So although we've put it into boxes, they do overlap. So the time periods, it's not a static thing. They overlap and they, they kind of flow into one another. So the apostolic period flowed into the, the persecuted church period, which then flowed into the imperial church period. So in the beginning, it was better. Towards the middle, it gets whatever it gets, and then towards the end it gets to the next phase of history. And so I've put it at the, at the end there, at the bottom there, in, in small print, because that's me, that's not history, I mean that's not the historians, okay, so that's, that's my little input. I believe 
we are end, going into, if not already quite well into, the term post-truth is a term I've heard recently quite a lot. So it's not my own invention, but I think it may be the label that will eventually be put onto the time period that we're going into now. So we've been since 1970 in the post-modern era, and I think it's going to be labeled the post-truth era, which follows on from the post-modern and, and, and that's another long story. Then, another aspect of Bible study and of understanding God's economy, which I'm just putting in here, maybe one day we will be able to unpack it even more, is how we study Scripture, we read, uh, we, we interpret Scripture by Scripture. So, these seven periods of church history beautifully fit the letters to the seven churches that, that, uh, that, that Jesus wrote through the Apostle Paul to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which we read about in Revelation chapter 3. So these ages, these periods of church history, and, and the historian who, who, who uh, uh, um, recorded that list didn't have the, this, what I'm telling you now. So the historians have come up with this list. With, apart from the seven church, letters to the seven churches. But if you look at the periods of history, and you look at the letters to the seven churches, how beautifully they match up. And right at the beginning, I'm not going to go into this in a whole lot of detail at all. This is just a, a, little, a little bit of a, a prod thrown in there just to provoke you to maybe you know, research a little bit more. Um, so I'm not going to go into it in any detail. But just to prod a little bit further, the two churches, the two letters to the two churches in Asia Minor that John sent these two letters, the worst two churches were Pergamum and Thyatira, is how you pronounce it, Thuwatera. We, we say Thyatira, it's actually Thuwatera. But um, those were the two worst churches. If you read those letters to the seven churches, those were the two worst. And they correspond with the period in history which I will submit to you, and I would, have to, I would have to argue this point because there will be many who would argue against my assertion, that these are the two worst periods of church history, the imperial church and the medieval church. So that's just a little bit of a, a prod. Um, we can look into that in, in, in more detail if you'd like. Please email me, I would love to discuss these things. The period that we are most concerned with as Anglicans is the Reformed Church, the English Reformation, was part of the greater uh, Reformation of the Church. And then it continues through into the modern church and the postmodern church where we are today. I'm going to start at the very beginning. Because I submit that the Anglican Church, the Church of England, if you like, started over there. So, I thought, how do I unpack church history in 20 minutes? How do I share with you all of that history in 20 minutes? And I thought, well, that's impossible. So what I'll do is I'll just focus on two misconceptions. I'll try and, and just focus on these two misconceptions. And in the process, we will go through a lot of church history and you'll get a good picture of where we are at today, why we are at where we are at today. And the two greatest misconceptions I feel, and I come from a non-Anglican background, so I have not only heard these things banded about, bandied about, but I sometimes in the past even made those criticisms myself. And so one of them is, it's all the fault of the Roman Catholics. So everything is the Catholic's fault. Okay? Everything happened because the Catholic Church did it. And the Catholic Church said, and the, so everything is all the Roman Catholic's fault. Now I'm not here to defend the Roman Catholic Church. I have a lot to say about the Roman Catholic Church. But I am here to defend truth. And so we must, we must not, uh, we must, we must focus on truth, and we must be honest, and we must be real and right. So we don't, uh, uh, um, we give credit where credit is due, and we don't lay blame where it's not warranted. Okay. So the first misconception is all the Catholics' fault. The second misconception is Anglicanism, the Church of England, was born because King Henry wanted a divorce. 
And so he created a church to get out of the clutches of Rome so he could have his divorce and do his thing. And, and that's a big one. Everyone thinks that. Okay? So, so we want to clear up those two misconceptions. And in the process, we're going to, we're going to deal with a whole lot of other stuff. And, and it's not going to be too long. I promise. It's already been 11 minutes. The third one is, which I haven't put in, and it's also something I put it in dull letters because it's also going to come up, and, and, but we're not going to deal with it at all, is that we are a sister church or a branch of the Roman Catholic Church. That Anglicans are just a branch of the Roman Catholics. And there's even a, 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 a segment of the Anglican Church who feel very Roman Catholic. And there are those who would like to be more Roman Catholic, and there are those who are even going back to the, the Church of Rome. It was this reason that we have Caesar. Has, ever, has anyone, everyone heard of Caesar? Church of England in South Africa. One of the, one of the famous splits in our, in our recent history. And it was because the Bishop of Cape Town wanted to go Roman Catholic. And it's now called REACH the Reformed Evangelical Anglican Church because they wanted to stay English Reformation and the Bishop of Cape Town wanted to go Catholic and so there was that split. And so now we have our, our, our sister church, not the Catholic Church, but REACH is actually our sister church um, because they are Anglicans but they are more Reformed Anglicans. Okay, we're getting to that. So, the first stage, I'm skipping the apostolic era because you can, we, 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 we read that in our, in our scriptures and we have a, good, a, a much better understanding of that history. The, the persecuted church. This was the first generation after the apostles. Clement of Rome died in 99. That means he died a year before the apostle John. Um, Ignatius of Antioch died eight years after the Apostle John. Polycarp is the one that we know for sure because Irenaeus, further down on the list, Irenaeus of Lyons, France, he was a student of Polycarp. And he writes about Polycarp's interactions with the Apostle John. So Polycarp and Papias of Hierapolis are two that we know interacted, had interactions with the Apostle John. So this is the first generation of leaders after the apostles. And they did some wonderful things. They established the ecclesiastic structure. So the um, episcopal comes from the word episkopos, which is the word for bishop, which means overseer. And so the episcopal church or the episcopal church structure, as we have in the Anglican church, comes from those um, words that we find in scripture, episkopos, presbyteros, and diakonos. The uh, presbyteros is the elder, diakonos is the deacon. And we read about uh, Stephen being elected as one of the deacons to serve. The word deacon means servant. And the apostles were, their, their, their ministry, their preaching ministry was hampered by this practical need to serve the widows. And so they appointed deacons, servants. And so they had to be spiritual men and so on. And so we have this um, episcopal structure which comes right from then already. We have it mentioned, we have it in scripture, we have in, in, in Acts, um, we have uh, uh, the word uh, presbyteros and, and, and episcopos used interchangeably. So that was used in, for bishop and um, what we would now call priest or what was known as an elder. So the church of the, the, the council of, of um, Jerusalem, the first church council in 50 AD where the apostles uh, convened this council, they, they had, they had uh, bishops and elders or they had, and, and they were used interchangeably. Then in the first generation of the apostles, we see that they begin to use them in this episcopal structure. So there is no, remember now the church is outlawed. This is not a church of Rome. This is not the Roman Catholic Church. This is the next generation of leaders that naturally take over the reins from the apostles. The people follow them because they are convicted by the words that they speak, the words of the apostles, and they are 
organizing themselves in a structure naturally. It's not a governmental, organizational thing. It's a natural flow from the apostles. The scriptures they used, um, and we get to the canon, uh, they used the scriptures that, that the apostles wrote. They, the, uh, um, Irenaeus, he mentions 21 books. Oregon mentions 27 books that became the New Testament. They, those are the scriptures they just used. It wasn't a, a formalized, formal uh, book that was already put together. It was the letters and the writings that were being circulated and copied so the other churches could have a, have a copy. And so these were the scriptures that they were, they were, that they were using. And so one of the historians writes, the, the canon of scripture was determined by the mind and the heart of the church. It wasn't a council that sat down and said, or, or, a, or a committee that sat down and said, okay, bring all the books. We're going to go through this one, and we're going to go through that one, and we're going to go through these ones, and we're going to choose these ones, and these ones. Okay, there's the Bible. It was, a, it was, by the, it was the mind and the heart of the church that used these writings and, and, and selected these ones and, 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 and used these ones more and more because they had apostolic authority, because they were referred to by the apostles and Jesus. So the, the books of the Bible came together by the heart and mind of the church. And then they were ratified by the councils later. Those books that were already being used by the church as scripture were then formally ratified as the official Old Testament and New Testament in the councils later. And then the Church of Rome and the Protestant church after the Reformation had a bit of a battle about which were the ones and so the Church of Rome included the Apocrypha and the Protestant church excluded the Apocrypha. And so those then, it was just a ratification of what had already been determined by these first generation leaders of the church. So we have the church structure, we have the, the canon of scripture and the doctrines of the church, what is orthodox doctrine. They wrestled with the writings of the apostles and they wrestled with those who were raising up a different opinion or a different idea or trying to determine what the apostles actually meant. And so they came to what, is, what was the orthodox doctrine of the church. And this church, if we go back to our, our list of the churches, this church is the church of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia are the two churches, letters to the seven churches, that have no reproach. They are the good churches. They have no reproach given by the Lord. So, you see the importance of comparing Scripture with Scripture. So that's the persecuted church. Then comes the, the imperial church. 313 to 476. And remember I said it's not a definite that day that church ended and this church started. It was a, it was a gradual progression. So the last great teacher the last great theologian, the last great defender of doctrine, of the, of, of the orthodox doctrine, we find in Aurelius Augustinus, Augustine of Hippo, Saint Augustine of Hippo. And what happens, Constantine, before then, before the emperor Constantine, the church, the Christian church is outlawed. The emperors before him uh, persecute the church. There are great martyrdoms. Polycarp was the great, one of the greatest uh, martyrdoms because it's, it was recorded. Uh, someone, an eyewitness, recorded, wrote it down, and so we have the, the actual uh, uh, martyrdom of Polycarp. So it's one of the famous martyrdoms. Um, so the whole period before that, there was persecution. And it's one of the reasons why it's the greatest church. Smyrna, the word Smyrna means death. It means it is, and Smyrna, the town was a place full of, of, of graves and tombs. There were these, in Smyrna today, you can see where Smyrna was. These, they're, they're like the Egyptian um, pyramids, but they're just they're burial mounds. So, it's very significant. I digress. Constantine, the first emperor to embrace Christianity. Christianity becomes the state, not yet, but uh, he doesn't, Constantine doesn't make Christianity the state religion. Constantine just makes it legal. And he slowly starts to suppress pagan religions. 
One would think, and most people think and believe, that this is a great thing. Today, in our country and other countries, we hear bandied about, we need to become a Christian nation again, as if this is a great thing. If we look through history, we find that the times of persecution was when the church became great. It was in the times of comfort and pleasure that the church becomes corrupt. And so, Constantine brings in an age of, of, of comfort to the church. He starts to build cathedrals. Uh, the word basilica comes from, uh, from a, a Roman court. A court. If you go to court and, you, and, you, and the judge sits there, and it's, it's like this. It's square. And it had pillars on the sides and it had... Uh, oh, sorry. I'm not describing St. John's Church. I'm describing a Roman court. So this basilica, this idea of big church buildings comes when the church has now this freedom to grow and expand and build buildings. And, and Constantine builds these buildings based on the architecture of Roman courts called basilicas. And he even takes um, his wife's, if I can just find it, his wife's palace, the Lateran Palace, and he converts it into a cathedral called the Golden Basilica. And you can go there today, I believe, it's St. John's, St. John, St. John Lateran, um, this, this palace of his wife that he converted into a, into a church. So Constantine brings in uh, church, big church buildings, and uh, he even then started consecrating pagan temples as churches. One of the good things he did was he, he um, convened the Council of Nicaea. And it was at the Council of Nicaea that we get the Nicaean Creed, which is one of the touchstones of our doctrine and our faith. There were, at that stage, a number, before even, a number of, of uh, councils. The Council of Nicaea was the first ecumenical council. The councils before that were more localized. The ecumenical councils were when the whole church had to come together, and all the bishops had to come together, and, and they made the decisions. Before that, there were more localized councils of church leaders, and these were mainly to confront doctrinal error. As I said, Aurelius Augustinus, St. Augustine, he was the last great uh, uh, defender of doctrine, and he confronted a number of heresies in, in, in uh, 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 particularly the councils of Carthage, and the biggest one there was the Pelagian controversy, which was mainly to do with sin and salvation. And the majority of heresies and conflicts in the church through the ages were over the three things, three main things. The Trinity, what is the, what is the, the nature of God? The nature of Christ, the person of Christ, the deity of Christ, is he God or man or is he both or is he one or the other or was he different in different times? And then the, the, the nature of sin and the means of salvation. These were the three main issues that caused um, uh, these councils and the need for these councils. Augustine confronted the era of Pelagianism that was uh, outlawed and, and put away until the 1600s when a man by the name of Arminius came to the fore and he re-resurrected uh, some of Pelagius' uh, thinking and that kind of thinking was carried on by one of the church greats, John Wesley. And so we have Methodism. Methodism became uh, 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 Anglican, uh, Anglicanism was the, was the Augustinian theology and Methodism was the Wesleyan theology. And we haven't got time to get into that. But I would love to get into that because it's one of my big issues in my ministry is uh, doctrine and right doctrine. And the, and, and the biggest thing is the issue of Augustinian theology as opposed to Pelagian theology. It's, it's major. It is major. Um, we think today that we, oh, we can, we, you can believe that and you can believe that and it's not a big deal as long as we all say, as long as we all love Jesus, we go to heaven. But actually, it is major. I'm a big picture type of person, so I look at the big picture and I see down the line what little things here are going to end up there. And it is a major issue in the church for the future. And it has been steady erosion. So, 
The imperial church brings in, it's a short period, it brings in this age. At this time, the emperor is the head of the church. Pontifex Maximus. We'll get to that. But he is the chief priest. Not only is he the emperor, before the emperors, the structure of Roman government was set up in such a way that there could not be an autocrat. There were two consuls, and they ruled together. And they had a, they had a senate, and the senate made the decisions. And so that it was an attempt to prevent an authoritarian type of government. By the time Augustus Caesar comes to the fore, it has, it has all been corrupted and he becomes an emperor. They didn't want a king or an emperor because that's corruption. You know that adage, um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there is, there is there, there's this attempt to, to resist a king or an emperor. They don't manage it and eventually we have emperors. And not only does the emperor become the king, but then he establishes Augustus establishes himself as as the chief priest not only the king of the country but the head of the church the head priest so we get into the medieval church and this is now moving into the medieval church the medieval period the worst period in my opinion because the imperial church started the rot it, it, it laid the foundation for the rot to set in and the medieval church is where the rot begins to flourish. If you have ever had any problem with mold, this is what it feels like. It's a slow, gradual corruption. And so the medieval church is when uh, the ascension of the bishops. So the bishops begin to attempt to assert their authority before, I want to just highlight this point, St. Augustus, at the, at the last council of Carthage, he says the Bishop of Rome tries to assert authority over, he was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, and the Bishop of Rome tries to uh, tell him what to do, and he says no bishop may call himself Prince of Bishops. In fact, he sends a message to the Bishop of Rome and says, well, I don't know if he sent it to the Bishop of Rome, he might have just said it at the, at the council. He said, Rome must keep its Roman nose out of African business. <laughs> at that stage, and the fathers, the early church fathers, although they had set up the structure of the Episcopal structure, it was, a, it was, like, the early, it was like the Apostolic Church. It was a bishop was simply an administrator over his diocese. The diocese uh, comes from the, the, the Greek word for uh, um, like housekeeping. So it's an administrative keep house. Diokain, keep house. It's an administrative position. And so the, 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 the bishop was an administrator over his house, over his area. And so it was very pragmatic, and very, so there was no great authority or, or great uh, um, status or position. This began to change as Rome started to try and establish its dominance. So Rome started to try and establish its dominance for various reasons, um, a number of which, one was because Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople, there was a power vacuum in Rome, and um, the Roman church began to organize itself according to Roman government and so they and, and eventually power corrupts and so the Roman pontiff decided he wanted to be over the emperor and so we have a steady progression until ultimately Pope um, I forget his name no Anyway, don't worry. Don't don't worry. worry. It's no. It's a, but his name is, is a contradiction. That's why Innocent, Pope Innocent the Third. Pope Innocent is the one who finally achieves total supremacy, where he gets it. He gets it right to have complete power and authority even over emperors. 
So, so he establishes an emperor and he doesn't like him, he takes him out and puts another one in place. And so that was the highest point of papal power. And they, and they used uh, the fact that Peter and Paul were in Rome and, they, and the, the worst part, if you, if you look over there, the frauds, this was the worst. They actually, and it's, and it's been established as fraudulent documents where they, um, they wrote these documents which said that they had supreme power. So the, um, the donation of Constantine was a, 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 a decree that Constantine supposedly wrote giving the, the Pope of Rome supreme power over the emperors because Constantine separated, split up and he had minor emperors to, to help govern this huge Roman Empire. So he gave the Pope, he didn't give the Pope, they said that Constantine had given the Pope's authority over the emperors. So you can see, I haven't got time to go into all the rest that I, that I would have loved to have gone into, um, um, but you can just see how the corruption set in and continued. That brings us to the Reformed Church. The corruption became so bad that there was need for reform. Godly men, godly people, men and women who studied and understood the scripture, because one of the, one of the ways in which they, they prevented reform was by keeping the populace ignorant of scripture. And so those who, those who were convicted, like Martin Luther, um, uh, John Wycliffe, um, Richard Rohr, those who actually could read and study scripture and had access to the scripture and, and saw what was written in scripture and the, and, the, and the excesses of the church began to speak out. And so this is why I say the English Reformation was not because of King Henry. The English Reformation started already in the 1300s. King Henry was only 15, 1520s going on to 1530s. So, there were people like Richard Rohl, who became a hermit because he was so disgusted by the, by the excesses of the church, and began to teach and preach orthodox doctrine. The doctrine of Augustine. What I didn't tell you was, Augustine was and is considered the greatest theologian since the Apostle Paul. Ever. It, Today, still, he hasn't been matched. Um, his, his theology is considered to be the greatest. Um, so, a lot of his theology is what fueled the Reformation. Richard Rohl, Walter Hilton, followed John Wycliffe, followed John Wycliffe was the first, well, he wasn't the first, but he started to write an English Bible. He started to translate the Bible into English. He didn't finish it. Um, someone, a friend of his, finished it after he died. And then Desiderius Erasmus. He was a Hollander, but he lived all over Europe. He was, he's considered one of the greatest theologians of the pre-Reformation era. And a lot of the, the reformers studied Erasmus and used a lot of his work. But he fell short of a complete Reformation. And so King Henry supported Erasmianism. Because he, he, he advocated a move away from the authority of a pope. But he continued to teach salvation by works. So the, the, the Romish traditions of penance and uh, 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 confession and uh, indulgences and all of these works that you have to do to earn your salvation, he accepted those. So Erasmus criticized the Church of Rome as much as he criticized, well, he criticized the Protestants as much as he criticized Rome. So he was kind of in the middle. So Henry could deal with him, because Henry didn't really want to a, a theological reform. Henry wanted divorce. So he didn't want the Pope to tell him what to do. So we get, the point here is that it started a long way before, and this is what I want to really highlight, is that the, the, the the Reformation started a long time before even Luther. And it started with the English. 
I, I, I didn't have time to really unpack the, the, the persecuted church, but what I really wanted, to use, wanted you to see in the persecuted church, that the Anglican church structure is very, very much like the early persecuted church. We have a bishop who controls a diocese, and that's where it ends. The Archbishop of Canterbury is a figurehead. He's not a pope. He doesn't have authority over the Diocese of Port Elizabeth. The, the Archbishop of Cape Town is the primate for Southern Africa, so he represents us at Canterbury for Southern Africa, all the Southern African um, Anglican churches. But he doesn't have authority over the Diocese of PE. So our bishop is our authority. And he's our administrator. And we don't have indulgences and, and confessional, and we don't uh, believe that the bread and the wine is the physical body and uh, flesh and blood of Jesus. And so our church structure and our th theology is a lot closer to that good, right church of the persecuted church in, of the first generation than many others. Many others. This is the thing that really excited me as I studied more and more about Anglicanism. So, King Henry, by the time uh, King Henry comes along, um, because he supported Erasmian, Erasmian theology, he opposed Luther. When Martin Luther in 1511 started to write against Rome, King Henry opposed him. And for that, he was given the title by the Pope, Pope Leo X, of Defender of the Faith. Does that title ring a bell? The monarch today is still known as the Defender of the Faith. In Henry's defense, he was married to Catherine of Aragon for nearly 20 years. So it wasn't like he just wanted a divorce, he just didn't like his wife anymore and he wanted a divorce. In his defense, his reasoning was sort of biblical. Because Catherine, it wasn't about a divorce really, it was about an heir. He needed an heir for his throne and Catherine wasn't producing a male child. And so he discovered in the book of Leviticus that you're not allowed to marry, you're not allowed to uncover your brother's wife's nakedness. I'm not going into the, into the hermeneutics here because it's shocking. But he decided that because he had married his brother's wife, Catherine of Aragon was the widow of his brother. And because he had married, and it was an arranged marriage for political reasons, and so because he had married his brother's wife, he thought he was being punished. And it made Leviticus, um, where is it? Leviticus 20 verse 21 made it even worse. Because there he read that if you uncover your husband's wife nakedness, you will be childless. And some of the theologians of his day helped him out and interpreted that to mean airless. So he was convinced that he had broken the law of God and that he was being punished and that he had to have his marriage annulled. After 20 something, nearly 20 years, he had to have his marriage annulled because it was a sin. He was in sin. It just so happened that he had fallen in love, <laughs> properly in love, with one Anne Boudin. And so he tried everything he could to get the Pope to annul his marriage. But he couldn't. And so, enter Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cranmer, fascinating story. One of my newfound heroes, Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cromwell <coughs> was, the, was the statesman and politician and lawyer. Thomas Cranmer was the churchman. And he was made the ninth Archbishop of Canterbury just before, in 1533. So this all happened in the space of a few months. He was consecrated. Thomas Cromwell passed the re re Restraint of Appeals Act in Parliament, which effectively gave the Church of England independence from the Church of Rome. And the King became the head of the Church of England. And so, legally, he was allowed to, and now as the head of the Church, he could himself annul his marriage. 
He had already married Anne Boudin in secret a year before. So he didn't have to remarry her, but he, where is it? He crowned her queen in June of that year. And then in 1537, Thomas Cranmer's greatest desire, the king lifted the ban on an English Bible. And so they could produce an English Bible and they took Tyndale, who had kind of done it in secret going over to France because uh, to, 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 to miss the persecution, he went over to Europe. And so they produced the King's Bible, the Great Bible, sorry, uh, the first English translation, which it became uh, redone by King James and became the King James Bible eventually. And so it wasn't because of his divorce that the Anglican Church came to be. But it was a catalyst that enabled Thomas Cranmer to realize his dreams. And Thomas Cranmer was an Erasmian theologian. And that is why Edward chose him. But, uh, sorry, uh, Henry. But Henry sent him on a mission to Europe to go and try and win favor with the King of Spain. While he was there, he had some interactions with Martin Luther. And he discovered Orthodox theology. And so by the time he came back, King Henry recalled him from Europe to come back to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. By that stage, he didn't want that job because his theology had changed. And he knew what was in, his, what was in it for him if theology had changed. Cromwell was Henry's right-hand man and Cromwell was executed because he displeased the king. So Cranmer, he knew what was in it for him because his theology had become contrary to what the king accepted. As, as The king didn't want a total break from Rome. The king only wanted a break from the authority of Rome. But not the other, it wasn't a theological break. It was a, it was a, a, a secular governmental Break. So, Henry was only in reform as far as breaking from the authority. He didn't want to change the whole theology of the church. He didn't want orthodox theology. He wanted Erasmian theology because that fitted his ideals. Orthodox theology was more than Erasmian. It was, it was a total break from those things of Rome that, that required uh, transubstantiation, the, the, the physical blood and, and flesh of Christ, uh, salvation by works. Um, Orthodox theology taught salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone. No works. And so, when Cranmer went over, he was influenced by Luther. And in this painting, uh, historians struggle to understand what, what, his, uh, what changed his mind the details of what changed his mind. And I'm coming to an end. And um, this painting gave them a really, really good idea of what changed his mind. In his hands, you can see little squiggles on the top of the book there. You can't, if you zoom in on a, on a, you can read what that says. And that book there, you can see squiggles there, writing on the pages, on the, ends of, on the, on the end of the pages. Um, you can see that if you zoom that in. If you zoom in on the, on the painting, on the photograph, you can actually read what it says. And that in his hands are the epistles of Paul. On the table are the, is the book Faith and Good Works by St. Augustine. So they could decipher from that painting what got to change his mind. When he studied Augustine against the epistles of St. Paul, he saw the reality of what Paul preached. Augustine interprets what Paul preached and he, and he saw the reality of what August, August, Augustine said was true biblical orthodoxy. For, for the history of the church, Augustinian theology was the standard of orthodoxy. And so he discovers that the church of Rome had so far departed from that standard of orthodoxy that he converts to reformed thinking and puts him on a back foot with the king. But he was a soft, gentle, placid guy, not a confrontational guy. And so he very diplomatically eventually um, 
eventually gets, gets his desire. After Henry, his son, I won't go into the details, a very interesting story of how this unfolded. Just very briefly, Cranmer's reform, his full reform, the way he wanted it, like the European reform under Luther, happened under Edward V. He was, he, was, he was a little boy, and so Henry had put Cranmer as one of his, what do you call those, uh, the, the advisor to, the, to a, a, a young king, uh, one of his advisors. Um, so he had a lot of authority, a lot of say, and so he was able to bring about his full reform of the Church of England under Edward. Mary comes into power after Edward. He died young, he, he got tuberculosis. And then Mary, Bloody Mary, comes into power. And she's Catholic, so she starts exterminating Protestants, left, right, and center, and executes Cranmer. Then Mary dies, and her half sister, Anne Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth, comes to the throne. And she is Protestant. And so she continues the reforms and establishes the Church of England as a Protestant Orthodox theological church. And so, when we come to the, the modern church, I've called it the Evangelical Church of Elizabeth. The Church of England became the Evangelical Reformed Church. And I'm going to run through this very quickly because this is now where we're at and going into the future. So our history is coming to an end. This is very, very basically, very simply, how, how the church then developed. How, the, how we came to be where we are today. In the various denominations, in the, in the various uh, um, splits and, and schisms that have happened, um, the, the Church of Elizabeth was an... Um, John Wycliffe, right before the Reformation started, a group, the supporters of John Wycliffe were known as Lollards. And they were Reformed. They were uh, Augustinian theology. They were, they were Orthodox, the Lollards. And so after, when, when, when Elizabeth came into power and Anglicanism became the established church, the Church of England became a reformed church, um, the, the Lollards became known as Puritans, the Lollards had been suppressed. They became known as Puritans and it was a, it was a happy Anglican Puritan church. Then the Puritans began to push for more of a separation from Romish things, traditions. They wanted to do, to do away with all the traditions, the vestments, everything. So they put pressure and so they split and Anglicanism became a separate um, church to the Puritans and then it split further down the line. Puritanism became Presbyterian, Congregational and so they're very similar theology but their practice is different. So they don't wear robes and things. But they have a very similar theology. Well, they did. Because us as Anglicans, our theology has changed from that Orthodox theology. So, the Anglicans, Anglicans, Methodism came out of Anglicanism. John Wesley never left the Anglican Church. He was always Anglican. Wesleyanism was a movement within the Anglican Church. <coughs> Only after his death did it become a separate um, denomination, a separate group outside of the Anglican Church. Then the Baptist came, and then through the course of, of history up until today, oh, we know about the various uh, uh, denominations that have split, and, and free churches that have come up, and the Pentecostals, and the Charismatics, and today we have a group known as the, well, it's not an official group, the Emergent Movement is, a, is another whole long story, the New Apostolic Reformation is another whole long story, um, there's still Roman Catholicism trying to get into our mix, and some of us trying to get into their mix. And so, so it's all a bit of a mixture. And this over here, I put that in, humanism and rationalism, that was part of the modern church. It started um, from the Renaissance, 1500s from the Reformation, 1500s, 1600s, and it's been steadily progressing. Rationalism, ra rationalism the age of science and reason, humanism, the, the elevation of human human condition as the primary importance and so that has been infiltrating the church steadily and so the church has been um, philandering is the word biblically it was always a, it was always a, 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 an unfaithfulness when Israel 
went over to the other side, it was unfaithfulness, it was always in the context of, of a, a male-female relationship, so it was unfaithfulness, and so, so the church had been philandering with the ways of the world, and so these ideologies and philosophies have been creeping in, science and reason, and, and I'm not saying that science is bad, I'm not saying reason is bad, so I have to really unpack that a lot more to really explain what I mean. But it's had an effect on the church until we get to where we are today where there's this great drive for ecumenism, the ecumenical movement, that is to bring us all back together in one. But the ecumenical movement, as I see it, is a, is a medieval church effort. The medieval church was one because it was one church. But it wasn't the one body of Christ. It was a ruled uh, autocratic type of system that kept the church, kept people deceived and in a, in a organization. The ecumenical movement is an attempt to get back to that one churchness outside of, and I believe the reason why this church is that second church of, of uh, Philadelphia, where the second church in the, in the seven the letters to the seven churches, the second, the, the other good church, is because it, although there is so much error and so much division or, or fragmentation in this period, it is a time where each person chooses for themselves where they will go, how they will worship. It is a time where you are ruled by the, by the convictions of your own heart, not by the dictates of an organization. And so that, I believe, is what is most pleasing to God. Not this oneness in an organization that rules you, but where you and I choose God for ourselves in our heart. In Isaiah chapter 1, read Isaiah chapter 1. The things that God established, the traditions, the ceremonies, what God told Israel to do, He says to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, I hate because you don't do it from the right heart. And so, I put the question mark, ecumenical unity, is it really a unity? I believe in my heart that the body of Christ is in unity. Because we're in unity of truth. When you read the scriptures as a truly born again believer of God, you read those scriptures, the Holy Spirit interprets for you and you have a right, even if it's slightly wrong, if you come under a correct teaching, you will have a right understanding and you will remain faithful. You will remain on the right path. And there are those believers all over the world, all throughout all of these organizations who are the one body of Christ. And when we begin to suffer persecution, that one body will come together in a physical, geographic, not necessarily geographic, but we will come into unity. Amen.